I'm so excited to be part of this convention, and I'm so proud of these young people who have put it together. I know they've worked hard, and it has been a labor of love. It's not something they are paid for. It's not something that they, this is something they're doing out of their hearts uh, and with no other motive than to try to help others uh, clear around the world to feel connected with each other and to feel connected with Christ. So I'm grateful to be a part of that. Now, I promise you, you're going to learn something new. I wish we were in person so that I could uh, communicate with you uh, and show you some a, a visual object lesson of what I'm talking about. But we're going to have to adapt a little because this is over the internet. But uh, stick with me. And I promise you, you're going to learn something new. We always ask a lot of questions, especially when we grow up uh, in our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We ask, why do we need to do things that other people don't do? Why do we live a word of wisdom? Why do we not drink coffee? Why do we not drink alcohol? Why do we do that when other people do it? And why do we live a law of chastity? Why are we faithful to our spouses and we don't engage in sexual relations outside of marriage? Why is it that we live that way when other people don't live that way? Why do we avoid pornography when other people don't avoid that? And why do we live the Sabbath day. Why do we keep the Sabbath day holy? For most people in the world, Sunday isn't just another day, but it's a recreational day. So why do we try to keep the Sabbath day holy? These are questions that young people have as they grow up in the church. Now, we know that we are children of God, and that is an absolute truth, but that doesn't answer the question. Why? Everyone's a child of God, and yet some children of God don't live the way we live. Now, we also know that we've been saved for the last days. We've been saved to come forth on earth at this time. That is also an absolute truth, but it doesn't answer the question. Well, everybody on earth right now was saved as long as we were saved, and they don't talk like they've been saved. I'll tell you that much. So why do we live a way that other people don't live? Because we're children of God? No, there has to be more. Because we've been saved for the last days, there has to be more. As true as those statements are, I want to give you another word that does set us apart. This is a youth that this is a word that answers the questions that youth have. And the word is birthright. Birthright. Oh, it's a good word. It's a general conference word. Oh, youth of the noble birthright. I, I mean, it is a good word. It's kind of like Mufasa. Say it again. Say it again. I mean, it's a good word. But we just don't know what it means. Now, if we were to go back into the Old Testament, then we could learn a little bit about what a birthright is. And then let's talk about how we have that birthright. We even sing songs about this word. You'll recognize this hymn. O oh, youth of the noble birthright right. Carry on, carry on, carry on. I teach at BYU and we change the words. We sing, marry on, marry on, marry on, because we want to get them married off. Now, birthright, what does it mean? Let's go back to the Old Testament. If we have a, if we have a dad and we have a mom, and we have a number one son, and we have number two son, well then let's add to the family. We have a daughter, we have a daughter, 
we have another son, and we have a baby, a baby boy. So there's our Old Testament family, and we're going clear back into the olden days. Now, dad is loaded. Dad has so much money. He has gold and silver and precious things. He has oxen and sheep and camels and donkeys, and he has servants. He is rich, rich, rich. He has land. Now, dad dies. Who gets the money? Mom, number one son, number two son, daughter, daughter, son, baby, baby. Okay, count the boys in the family. One, two, three, four. Four boys. So dad's estate is divided into five equal shares. Baby gets his share, and he's out of here. The other boys get their shares, and they're gone to make their way in the world. The number one son gets two shares. He doesn't get all of it, but he gets an extra portion. If you're taking notes, write birthright equals extra portion. That's what the birthright equals. You can read more about this in the Bible dictionary, but don't look under birthright. Look under the words firstborn, firstborn, and then you'll be able to read about this. Now, why does he get the extra portion? Well, notice something. He's not going anywhere. His brothers took off, but he stays because he has to care for his mother. He has to care for his sisters. He has to provide them dowries so that they can be properly married. He has to stay to the end of his days. He'll get married. He'll have his own children, but he will stay to the end of his days to govern the affairs of his father's estate, his father's kingdom. So he cares for his brothers and sisters, and he governs the affairs of his father's estate. Hmm, he gets an extra portion, but with the extra portion comes added responsibility. Now do you start understanding why we sing a hymn in the church that says, Because I have been given much, I too must give. We have been given much. <coughs> we have a birthright. We've been given an extra portion temporally and spiritually. Do you realize that just because you have one change of shoes? Now, sisters, think about your closets. Just one change of shoes puts you at the very top of humans who live on this planet. And if one change of shoes puts you there, where on earth does the chance for a college education put you? I hope you realize that you've been given an extra portion temporally and spiritually. Even if you don't feel like you've been given a lot temporally, think of the blessing you've been given spiritually as a member of the church, you know answers to questions that baffle other people. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going after I die? We know answers to questions. We learn about them when we're little children. And these are the questions that baffle theologians, those who study God and religion at the universities. Yet we have answers. We go into a temple where we receive an endowment. The word means gift. A gift that other children of God don't yet receive. I hope you realize how much you've been given. Because once you realize that, then you also realize that God's not asking too much. If he asks you to live commandments that other children don't live, 
if he asks you to serve in a way that other children don't serve, is that too much to ask? Is he really picking on you? Not when you consider the blessings that you have in such rich abundance. Yeah, but Brother Wilcox, where did I get these blessings? Where did I get these blessings? Let's go back to the Old Testament again. And let's talk about not a pretend family on my fingers, but let's talk about a real family, the family of Jacob. Now let's start at the very beginning, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve made a covenant with God. And they lived that covenant. But as their posterity drifted away from that covenant, then God came and made the covenant another time with a prophet named Enoch. Well, you remember his city was lifted up because they were so righteous. Then God made the covenant again with another prophet. His name was Noah. And if you don't remember him, think about the flood and the ark. Then God made the covenant again with a man named Abraham. You may have heard this covenant called the Abrahamic covenant, but it didn't start with him. It started with Adam. We could call it the Adamic covenant, or we could call it what the scriptures call it, the new and everlasting covenant. Everlasting because it's eternal and new because it's been given new in every dispensation of time throughout the earth. So we call it the Abrahamic covenant, but it didn't start with Abraham. Just like we call the Melchizedek priesthood after an ancient prophet named Melchizedek, but it didn't start with him either. He was just a wonderful example of someone who lived that lived righteously. And the same is true of Abraham. Now, Abraham had a son named Isaac, and God renewed the covenant with Isaac. Then Isaac had a son named Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God renewed the covenant with him. And that's where we're going to start. The fourth dispensation, the third generation, Jacob. If you go to Genesis 29, you can follow along with this or study more about it. Jacob was a righteous man, and because of his righteousness, then he received a new name. Now, as you go into the temple, young people, you will also have that experience. You will receive a new name, and his new name was Israel. So Israel isn't just a country. Israel was a man. And the house of Israel is the family of Jacob. When the prophet talks about gathering Israel, he's talking about gathering the descendants of Jacob, his posterity. Now, Jacob wanted to marry a girl named Rachel. And he worked for four years, no, I'm sorry, seven years to be able to marry her. But by the time it was time for her to get married, then her older sister wasn't married. And that was improper for the older sister to marry after the younger sister. So Leah married Jacob first, and then Jacob married Rachel. What? Brother Wilcox, that's like polygamy. No, it is not like polygamy. It is polygamy. It is polygamy. Well, Brother Wilcox, I thought that's awful and wicked and evil. No. Sometimes in history, God has asked his children to live this way. Right now, he has not asked us to live this way. And living this way would be considered wrong in our faith. But this was a time 
when God asked his children to live this way, some of his children, and another time was the early church. Oh, Brother Wilcox, I'm struggling with my testimony because I found out that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. Well, how come nobody seems to be struggling with his testimony because Jacob was a polygamist? And that's right in the Bible. We have to remember that God does not ask this of all of us, and we don't have to live this way in heaven. But for now, some of his children have been asked to live this way. When people say, why? Why did Joseph Smith have to practice polygamy? Why did Brigham Young have to practice polygamy? I always say, to get me here. Because I have polygamists in my ancestors. And if you think, well, I don't have polygamists in my ancestors, you're just not going back far enough. Because yes, you do. If you go clear back to this family, your great, 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 great grandparents, then they did practice polygamy. So they got you here. And we should be very grateful for that. Well, Jacob married Rachel, and then he married Leah, and then Leah started having children. She had son number one, Reuben. She had son number two, Simeon. Son number three, Levi. And son number four, Judah. Now about then, oh my gosh, Rachel's feeling so bad. She says, man, my sister is filling the primary at church. All the kids in the primary belong to my sister. And so I want to have children too. So she says, Jacob, will you marry my handmaiden, Bilhah? And will you have children to me through her? So Jacob marries Bilhah, and she becomes what's called a concubine. A concubine. Oh, Brother Wilcox, I thought those were wicked and evil. Well, they are in the Book of Mormon where King Noah takes them without authority. But a concubine is simply a secondary wife, a wife from a lower social status. In this case, Bilhah was Rachel's handmaiden, Rachel's servant. But she marries Jacob. She becomes Jacob's third wife and his first concubine. And then she has Dan, and she has son number six, Naphtali. Now about then, Leah thinks this is a great idea. Get another woman to have your children? I love this idea. And she says, will you take my handmaiden, Zilpah, and will you have children to me through her? So Jacob marries Zilpah. She becomes his fourth wife and second concubine. So we have Leah, first wife, Rachel, second wife. We have Bilhah, the first concubine, the third wife. And we have Zilpah, the second concubine, the, fir the fourth wife. And Zilpah has Gad, number seven, and Asher, number eight. Then you think it's got to be Rachel's turn. I mean, after all those kids, it's got to be Rachel's turn. No, it's not poor Rachel's turn. Not yet. Leah kicks in again. My goodness, the woman is a machine. <laughs> and she has Issachar, number nine, and she has Zebulon, Zebulon, number 10, and the only daughter who's mentioned in the scriptures, and that's Dinah. Now, surely there were other girls in this family, <coughs> but Dinah is the only one who is named, and that is a daughter of Leah. 
Well, finally, please tell me it's Rachel's turn. And yes, finally it is. After all that time, Rachel finally has her children. And she has Joseph, number 11. And she has Benjamin, number 12. He's the baby. So how many sons? 12. How many tribes of Israel? 12. Oh, Brother Wilcox, it's like a light just went on. It's like, I understand. No, you don't understand. And the light did not go on. But stick with me because it will. The first thing you need to understand is that Levi was not a typical tribe. Levi was the priesthood. So he didn't have a land of inheritance. His descendants were spread throughout all the other tribes, and he provided the priesthood so that they could perform ordinances like sacrifices. So have you heard of the Levitical priesthood? Well, one of his... One of his descendants was Aaron, and Aaron was the brother of Moses. So Aaron was so righteous that he, his posterity, became the priest or the high priest in the, change the name, Aaronic priesthood. Ah, now do you understand how that ties in? The Aaronic priesthood. So Levi is not a typical tribe. That means there's only 11. And we better tell President Nelson, because he has 12 oxen under every one of those baptismal fonts. And we better hack one of those puppies out of there, because there's only 11. No, there's 12. Where does the other tribe come from? Remember the word we're learning. It starts with a B birthright, birthright. Um, that's the word we're learning. And who has the birthright? Reuben, the oldest son. He has the birthright. So instead of one tribe, he has an extra portion. He has two. But Reuben also has something else. He has a morality problem. And it's a big one. He actually sleeps with one of his father's wives. Oh, my goodness. Bilha. Yikes. It's worse than Downton Abbey. It's like a, it's like a, a show on TV that you don't want to watch. But it's right in the Old Testament. It's right there. It's right in the Bible. But they repent. Yay for repentance. Yay for repentance. Reuben repents, and he retains his tribe. But he loses the birthright. And the birthright goes not to the second-born son, who is Simeon. If, if dad only had one wife, that would be the case. But dad has more than one wife. So the birthright goes to the firstborn of the second full wife, and that's Rachel. So her son that was firstborn is Joseph. Go, 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 Joseph. Na, 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 na. Come on now, Joseph. Na, 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 na. See, Joseph, do you remember the coat of many colors? Do you remember the story? If you just read the storybooks, it says that Joseph got the coat because he was daddy's little favorite. In 1988, a young apostle named Russell M. Nelson came to BYU and he gave a devotional. The devotional, if you want to look it up, was called Thanks for the Covenant. Thanks for the Covenant. And in that devotional, he said, Joseph didn't get the coat because he was daddy's little favorite. Daddy's a prophet. He doesn't have favorites. 
Joseph got the coat because it was a symbol of the birthright. It was a symbol of the extra portion being passed from Reuben to Joseph. Well, why didn't his other brothers get it? Because it's part of the extra portion. An extra portion for which he would have extra responsibilities. He would have to care for his family. Did he do that? Oh, yeah. He saved their stinking lives. He would have to govern the affairs of his father's kingdom. Did he do it? Oh, yeah. And Egypt at the same time. He fulfilled his birthright. That's what was symbolized in the coat of many colors. Now, for some of you who are acquainted with the temple, let's explain something here. The word in the Old Testament that was translated as coat, as in something we wear over our clothing, could easily have been translated as coat, as in coats of skins, as in a garment worn under the clothing, next to the skin. Whoa! The coat that Joseph was given is something that many of you have also been given. A garment that reminds you of the extra portion that you have received. Well, instead of one tribe, then Joseph had two. He had two sons. The firstborn was named Manasseh. The secondborn was named Ephraim. If you go to Genesis 48, you find out that these two boys, these grandsons, were adopted by Jacob so that they would be on equal footing with the other tribal leaders. And he adopted them in a different order. He adopted Ephraim first, and then he adopted Manasseh. So there you have it, the 12 tribes of Israel. Levi's not a traditional tribe, and Joseph is not a traditional tribe. Joseph has two, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Oh, well, Brother Wilcox, thank you. That was a nice little Sunday school lesson. You did a good job. That was really interesting. But what does this have to do with me? If you have your patriarchal blessing, then I could ask you to raise your hand, and I could say, how many are from Ephraim? How many are from Manasseh? How many are from other tribes? And you would know. Do you realize how rare that is? For most people in the world, this is just a story. But for us, this is family history. For most people in the world, this is just a Broadway play, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. But for us, this is very personal because we know how we connect to this family. And why do we need to know that? Because we also have been given the birthright of Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim, temporal kingdom builders. Manasseh, spiritual kingdom builders. Ephraim teaching Manasseh leadership, Manasseh teaching Ephraim faith and testimony and spirituality. And together, Ephraim and Manasseh have been tasked with gathering Israel. Yeah, but where did Israel go? Where did Israel go? Oh, this is really interesting. It's, it's better than Indiana Jones. So stick with me. Assyria, bloodthirsty warriors from the north, came down into the land of Israel. They took the northern kingdom, ten tribes. They killed them, or they took them off captive, 
and they separated them through lots of lands so that they couldn't fight back. And within a generation or two, they forgot who they were. The tr those tribes are lost, not because they need a map, not because they're wandering around under a polar ice cap, not because they don't know where they are. They're lost because they don't know who they are. They don't know they belong to this special family. Now, the tribes that weren't lost, the tribes that weren't lost were Judah and Benjamin. Their lands were close to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was miraculously protected. So the Benjaminites are found among the Jews. Do the Jews know who they are? Yeah. Do they know they're related to this family? Yes. Even if they're not religious, they know they are Jews. They're not lost because they know who they are in regard to this family. They're not gathered yet either, but they do know who they are. Well, with the restoration of the gospel came the Book of Mormon, the instrument of gathering. And with the restoration came the keys. Moses came to Joseph Smith in the Kirtland Temple, and he restored the keys of the gathering of Israel. Wow, think about it. That means Moses, the very one who parted the Red Sea, the very one who took Israel out of slavery, came again to take Israel out of a different kind of slavery, the slavery of ignorance. And slowly but surely, the descendants of Ephraim started joining the church. Slowly but surely, the descendants of Manasseh started joining the church. Why Ephraim and Manasseh first? Because they are then tasked with gathering the rest of Israel. And it's happening. It's happening. When Sister Nelson, the prophet's wife, went to Russia, she said, I found all 12 tribes. All 12 tribes. Descendants of all 12 tribes. It's happening. It's happening right before our very eyes. Now, why does it need to happen? Why do we gather Israel? We gather Israel first so that then Israel can gather all of God's children back to him. The gathering of Israel isn't the end. The gathering of Israel is a means to the end. We are gathering leaders worldwide. Andreas, Yvonne, Kevin, Ashley. We're gathering leaders worldwide. And these leaders will then be able to help gather all of God's children home. The gathering of Israel will happen in preparation for the second coming. The gathering of all God's children after that will happen during the millennium. So we're just getting ready for Jesus to come. He has to have an organization to come to. Now, you live in a time where everybody says, oh, we don't need organized religion. But the opposite is true. We need the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to be organized so that Jesus can come and lead the church at a time when many will want to join. When Jesus shows up and says, hey, by the way, I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Do you think there's going to be a little interest in the church? Do you think there's going to be people who say, I want to learn more? Oh, yeah. 
by the billions. Did you hear what I just said? Billions. Right now, not many people in the world even know about our church. But when Christ comes, everyone will know about it. And everyone will want to learn and join. Are we going to be ready? If two billion people wanted to join the church tomorrow, would we be ready? Would we have enough bishops, enough Relief Society presidents, enough full-time missionaries, enough tithe payers? No, we would be swamped. We would be completely overwhelmed. Well, Jesus can't invite all people to come to him until we're ready to receive them and give them the ordinances they need. And so right now we are preparing and the gathering of Israel is part of that preparation. Then we will all get assignments in the millennium even the tribes will get assignments as they work to gather all of God's children's home. So right now, do we know what the assignments of the tribes will be? No. Anybody works with Ephraim and Manasseh in preparing for the second coming. But when the second coming comes, then there will be other assignments. But we'll know our tribes. So we won't just have the church organization, but we'll have an additional level of organization that is going to be able to bless the world. In the scriptures, we read that when Christ comes, the government shall be upon his shoulders. That means that when Christ comes, there's nobody who will rule over him. He will rule over the world. And that means there will be no more parliaments, no more kings, no more prime ministers, no more presidents, no more senates, no more congressmen. And that means that the work of governing the world will belong to Christ and his disciples, his followers. That means it's going to be us. Can you imagine Christ saying, if you are from the tribe of Zebulun, then you're in charge of health care. Well, I'm not a doctor. No, nope, just get it organized. If you're from the tribe of Issachar, you're in charge of education. Yeah, but I'm not a teacher. You don't have to be. Just get it organized. Can you imagine when you receive your patriarchal blessing and you are told that you are part of a tribe, that's not just talking about your past. It's also talking about your future and how you will fit into this organization that will be tasked with bringing all of God's children home. Let me end with one simple analogy that might help you understand. Let's say God loves all of his children. Let's just say that. And because he loves all of his children, he sent them on a big ocean liner cruise. USS Earth. It's a big ocean liner. Why would he do that? Why would he send his children away? Well, because he wants them to learn and grow. He wants them to learn to work and love each other. He wants them to find joy. But he also wants them to come home. So he looks among all of his children and he finds you. And he makes you part of his crew. You are not a passenger. You are a crew member. Why did he choose you? Because somehow in this pre-mortal world, you did something that allowed him to trust you. He loves all of his children. But he trusts you. 
I hope you realize what it means to be trusted by God and not just loved by him. He has trusted you with the safe return of all of his children. So when you look around yourself on that ship and you say, everybody's wearing immodest bathing suits, how come I can't do that? Everybody's drinking and dancing and partying into the night. How come I can't do that? Everybody's eating at the all-you-can-eat buffet. How come I can't do that? Will you remember who you are? You're a crew member. You have responsibilities that passengers don't have. But you also get something that passengers don't get. A paycheck. <laughs> There's nothing that you could ever be asked to do in this church for which you haven't already been paid. Paid in advance and paid in full because you have a birthright. Now we've come full circle. We began with that word and we end with that word. That answers the question, why? Don't you dare let the world change you. When you were born to change the world. Don't let the world leave its mark on you. When you were born to leave your mark on the world. I bear my testimony that I know who you are. I know how special you are. I know how important you are. I know the work that God is giving you as he prepares the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ and for the gathering of all of his children home to him. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, Andreas, we have some time for questions. If you've got some that you want to throw out, I've done something new. Um, I Good. maybe you did. So maybe, um, yeah. Um, so right now, um, everyone is welcome to uh, to write some questions in the either in the chat or in the question and answer um, section. Thank you. We actually have a, a couple of questions coming in right now. So the first question from Lalita Glory says, people say Israel have the original Bible. How far is it true? Okay. Um, uh, the original Bible is what they call, what we would call the oldest Bible, the oldest copy. Um, there was a book of Adam. In Egypt, they talk about a book of Adam, but we don't have a copy of that book. So the earliest thing we have are the writings of Moses, the first books of the Old Testament. And those are the oldest ones we have. Can we trust that after all these years, those writings that have been translated over and over and over again. Can we trust those writings? Um, there was a remarkable find in Israel called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls were copies of copies of copies of the, the Old Testament. And so those are the oldest copies we have, but we can compare those to the modern Old Testament, and we can find that the translation has been done pretty well, and that there is, we can trust what's there. So, yeah, uh, Israel does have the oldest 
copies of the Bible. And if you go to Israel, you can see copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But I just want to remind you that the Bible isn't the only scripture that's available, available to us. We also, along with the Old Testament, we have the New Testament written by followers of Christ after his earthly ministry. We have the Book of Mormon, which was written by prophets before Christ and after Christ in the Americas. We have modern revelation today that comes to prophets, and that is in the Doctrine and Covenants. So we are so blessed to have more scriptures that can teach us about this covenant we've talked about. Okay, excellent. Thank you for answering that question. We have a couple more that are coming in. Um, someone asked, what is a valuable lesson you learned because of this pandemic? I'll tell you one thing I've learned is that there were things I took for granted. I took for granted gathering with my ward. I took for granted going to the temple. And I don't think I'll ever take those for granted again. I took for granted gathering with the youth and having the youth gather. I just took that for granted. And now I will never take it for granted again. In the United States, where some of the restrictions are easing, we're seeing young people gather again. I spoke at a stake the other day and they said their goal was to have 350 youth show up at the youth conference. Do you know how many showed up? 450. The youth are hungry to gather. They're hungry to get together again with their friends. They're hungry for the spiritual nourishment that they have been missing. So I'm grateful for those that have allowed us to gather together today and just know that people are hungry to gather. And that's something I've learned in the pandemic. I've learned that the importance of gathering together and being together. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question um, from YouTube from Givy Rue. What can be the first step to take in order to understand my part in this great work? The very first step to take is to get a patriarchal blessing. If you're not a member of the church, then you'll need to join the church first and then get a patriarchal blessing. That patriarchal blessing is an inspired pronouncement by the Holy Ghost through a patriarch of your tribal lineage. Now, remember, it's not a DNA test. It's not telling you where all your ancestors came from. The bloods are very mixed. If we talk in Harry Potter language, we're all mud bloods. We're not pure bloods. So there's not a pure blood descendant of Ephraim. But that patriarch declares our lineage. And then as we learn today, that also determines future assignments that we don't even know yet. So if your mom and dad are from Ephraim, does that mean you're going to be from Ephraim? Could be, but you might be pronounced from another tribe. I know of two twins, one is from Ephraim and one is from Manasseh, and they're twins. So remember, it's not a DNA test. It's not a scientific pronouncement. It's a spiritual pronouncement, but it does tell you the tribe from which you will receive your blessings and the tribe through which you will bless others. But then the patriarchal blessing will tell you more. It will be a personal scripture to you that tells you what God wants you to do. And it is a beautiful way of finding out how you can help in this latter day work because you will be reminded of your gifts and your talents. And 
certain things that God has sent you on earth to do. And you'll be amazed as you receive personal revelation, you'll be amazed to see how God is guiding your life, how he is helping you find the path he wants you to go on. He can tell you his plan for you. Now we have a we know that he has a plan for all mankind, but he also has a plan for each man and each woman. And it's very individual and very personal. And as you start asking, he will start answering. And you will be able to receive a patriarchal blessing that gives you a first step toward finding out what your mission is in life. What is it that he wants you to do? And it's a wonderful thing to know that you're on the right track. My son, who's 28, uh, is in medical school in Texas. He called this morning because he said, I just passed my last test for my third year in medical school. And he said, I was driving home and I felt so happy because I know that this is what God wants me to do. I found one of my missions in life. In college, he didn't know what he wanted to do. He was all over the place. He changed his major every other month. And finally, he decided on medical school. And then for the first two years of medical school, he said, I don't know what kind of doctor I want to be. I don't know. During this third year, he's done some rotations and he finally decided to become an anesthesiologist. He said, Dad, now we have something in common. We both put people to sleep for a living. Now, um, he has found what God wanted him to do. God didn't come to him and say, I want you to be a doctor. But God guided him. And now, three years later, he says to me, I'm so happy because I have found, I know I'm on the right track. And you can have that same assurance in your life too. Uh, 28 minutes, maybe, like 20, um, to try and, and get through all of your questions. So let's see, the next question is, uh, what are some responsibilities from the tribe of Judah and what can I do to gain more knowledge about it? Yeah, the tribe of Judah is the tribe that Jesus was born through. And that's important because then Jesus blessed the whole world with his atonement. So Judah is a very important tribe. Now, if you are a member of the church and you're from the tribe of Judah, Think about how blessed you will be able to be when you are able to teach other Jews about Jesus. How blessed you'll be able to be to help those who are also of the tribe of Judah to learn about Jesus. Now, you can go to learn more about the tribes. You can go to Genesis 29. That's a good place to go and learn more about the tribes. And you can also go to another uh, Deuteronomy 33. And then you have some writings about the different tribes. But Judah um, is, is uh, the name means praise. And the symbol of Judah is a young lion. So if you are of the tribe of Judah, you can ask yourself, how can I be like a young lion as I share the gospel and praise the Lord? Share the gospel and praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Our next question is, thank you so much. Our next question is, uh, oh, hold on. I scrolled up. Here it is. 
What do you do when you feel stuck in life and that your attributes are not needed or that you don't feel like it's useful or working? Yeah, it's easy to start feeling that way. It's easy to start feeling stuck. And it's easy to feel like maybe God doesn't have a plan for you because your life isn't going the way you thought it would. Maybe you thought, gosh, I thought for sure by now I'd be married. I thought for sure by now I'd have kids. I thought for sure by now I would be successful in my career. And yet it's not unfolding as you want it to. Just trust that God can make good things come out of situations that we may not like. Just like we talked about COVID and how some good things have come out of that. It was hard. It's not what we liked, but some good things have come from it. And I just want to assure you that God can help you move in good directions. And he'll take you step by step, step by step. And slowly but surely, he will guide you. So just don't give up on him and don't give up on yourself. And when you feel like your life is stuck in neutral, when you feel like you're at a plateau, just remember that sometimes that just means you're going to grow again. It's time for you to grow again. And when you feel like some bad things are happening in your life, think, this is God stretching me. I love the story of how the little seed got planted in the dirt and felt so bad because he felt buried. He said, am I such a bad seed that I would be buried and hidden away from the world? But then he grew into a plant and he realized that God wasn't burying him, God was helping him grow. Thank you. Our next question is by Patricia San Martin. How can I best live up to my birthright so that I don't end up living beneath my privileges? Uh, Patricia, si habla español, yo le saludo y le digo que le quiero. Um, the very fact that you want to not live below your privileges tells me that you are doing the right things. Because in today's world, so many people are content to just drift, content to just get by. They're content to just settle. And the very fact that you ask that question tells me that you're not content to do that. Your spirit is reaching upward and that's a good thing because one kid said to me, I don't need to go to church. I'm a good person. I'm, I'm a good person. I don't need church. And I said, you are a good person. But remember, the purpose of church isn't to reward us for being good. The purpose of church is to help us be better. So my answer to you as you reach upward and you try to be better. Stay strong in the church and serve. Look around you at those who have struggled during COVID, who might need you to be a friend, to be a ministering sister, to be a teacher. Look around you in the church for people who've gotten discouraged, for people who are slipping away, and just try to be there for them. And then you'll find that you'll start feeling a sense of purpose um, that will help you. Don't wait to be called. Don't wait to have a plaque on your chest that makes you a full-time missionary. Just start reaching out and helping in the church. I'm going to go down to the nursery in my ward on Sunday because they just called a new nursery leader 
and I used to be a nursery leader. So I'm going to go down and teach her how to do it because she doesn't know all the tricks. It's a small thing, but it's a way for me to help in my own ward and help these little children. So just look for ways to serve in the church. Was I called to go down to the nursery? No, it's not my calling right now, but it doesn't mean that I can't see a need and try to meet that need. And then I can start feeling like I'm reaching upward. And then I can start feeling like I'm reaching upward and getting somewhere. Thank you for those amazing examples. Uh, we have a question from Joshua. How can you be a direct descendant if both of your parents are both adopted to the same tribe? And why is there a difference between the direct and adopted descendants? Okay, remember a direct descendant would mean that you have the blood of Israel in you. Now remember, it might just be a little bit from many, 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 many generations ago. But that blood is there. Most members of the church and those who join the church are direct descendants. The blood of Israel is within them. But if for some reason there's no blood of Israel in that person and he joins the church, then through his covenants, through the covenant of baptism, he comes into the house of Israel. And he is adopted into the Israel, and he is able to help prepare for the second coming. So whether we're born with the blood of Israel in us, or whether we respond to the Spirit and come into the church and are adopted into the blood of Israel, there's no difference. And remember that our goal isn't to get everybody in the house of Israel. Our goal is just to have Israel ready as leaders so that then we can invite everyone to come in by baptism to God's house, to his eternal family. And that's our ultimate goal. So don't get too hung up on, well, wait, my dad's from this tribe, my mom's from this tribe, I'm from a different tribe, how can that be? Remember that these are spiritual pronouncements. And it's not just a pronouncement of the what bloodline you're in, because the blood has been mixed all over the world. So in Japan, you have the blood of Ephraim, the blood of Manasseh. In the Polynesian islands, you have the blood of Ephraim, the blood of Manasseh. In India, you have the blood of Ephraim, the blood of Manasseh, because that blood has been scattered all around the world. And now we're trying to find those people who've been scattered, gather them together so that they can help prepare for the second coming. Thank you. We have another question from Liam Hoffman. It seems to me that no matter how much temple we build, we are never going to be ready to welcome everyone at the second coming. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's wonderful to see so many temples being built. You can tell that they are getting closer. We are getting closer to the second coming. But remember, the temple building will continue in the millennium. So that's when the real gathering happens. Maybe one of the tribes, maybe they're going to say, if you're from the tribe of Simeon, you're in charge of temple building, and you're going to organize that. We know that we will continue to build temples long into the millennium. And there, people say, well, how will you do work for the dead if you don't have records? Well, there will be a very thin veil between the spirit world and those living during the millennium. And people will be able to come and say, hey, I don't have a birth certificate. I was born in China 2,000 years before Christ, but I want to join the church. This is my name. And they will be able to do work for that person 
because they will know her name because she will tell them her name. I mean, can you imagine how exciting it's going to be to be doing that work at that time? But you're right. Just like we need to have temples built, we need to have people worthy to enter temples. If there's only one temple, we're not ready for the second coming. We've got to have temples all over the world so that we're ready when there's so many people who want to come and be part of this work. Thank you so much, Brother Wilcox, and thank you uh, for your questions. Our next one. I try to be open. We have another question from Erica. She says, since Jesus Christ came to the world through the tribe of Judah, are there any responsibilities or implications added to members of that tribe because of Jesus Christ? As I said before, I think the fact that Jesus came through the house of Israel is significant. And he came through the tribe of Judah, and that's significant. Those who are of the tribe of Judah have a great responsibility to teach the world, especially other Jews, about Jesus. Every time I go to Jerusalem, I stand at the western wall where the Jews pray, and I cover my head, and I go to the wall, and I pray, and I pray that the Jews on both sides of me, the Jews who are with me at that wall, will one day understand that Jesus is their Savior. And I pray for them. And so I know that, that that's a, going to be a big responsibility of Judah those who have accepted Christ and those who are in the church who are of Judah, they will be able to be a light and teach so many Jews to expand their vision and recognize their Savior. But I appreciate you saying something nice. That makes me feel good. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Giselle Montserrat. If we all come from the 12 tribes of Israel, is the term Gentiles misused? Gentile means somebody who is outside. So sometimes in the church, we say those who are non-members of the church are Gentiles. They're outside. Jews say those who are not Jews are Gentiles because they're outside that circle. So as the circle of belonging increases, then the number of Gentiles decreases. But remember that there are Gentile lands or lands that were not originally of Israel. And there are people in those lands who have the blood of Israel. So you can be of Israel and you can live in a Gentile land. When you read in the Book of Mormon about Gentiles, keep that in mind. It's talking about lands, not necessarily people, because we know that there are lots of people of the blood of Israel in every land. So they're talking about Gentile lands, and we're trying to gather the blood of Israel from all over the world so that that circle of belonging can grow and grow until it includes everyone, everyone. Excellent, thank you. And we just have an extra comment, another comment that says, we love you. Oh, I love you too. There's a heart coming out at you right there. There's a heart. And if we were together, I'd give you a big abrazo in Spanish. Kevin told me the word in German is amo. Yeah, amo. I give you a big old hug because I love you too. I'm so grateful that you're interested in, in connecting with each other, connecting with Christ, connecting with the house of Israel. I, I am just so grateful for that because it's those connections 
that give purpose and peace and happiness and joy to our lives. And I want everyone to feel that joy. I think we better stop now. I don't want to overstay the time, but I just want to thank you all for joining in and keep connected. This growing, Grow to Gather is a wonderful organization that is reaching out and helping so many people feel noticed, included, and feel like they belong. And we need that. We need that in our lives. We need that after COVID. So I admire all of you who are sacrificing to keep this connection going. And I want to tell you that I support you 100%. So Kevin, Yvonne, Ashley, Andreas, all of you who are helping this happen, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I love you. I love you. With all my heart, I love you. I'm proud of you. And you're not alone. We're together in this. And you just remember that next time I see you and you come up to me and say, hey, I listened to that House of Israel talk you gave on Grow to Gather. I'm going to give you a big hug because now we're friends. And I say that in the name of Christ. Amen.